In this video, we're going to explore and prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, particularly that aspect of the fundamental theorem which we might call the evaluation theorem. This theorem provides an amazingly slick way of evaluating definite integrals in certain situations. Until now, we've been emphasizing how you build a, a definite integral out of a sequence of Riemann sums. So here's a midpoint sum with one subdivision, and we could watch as the number of divisions increases. And generally, if we allow the number of divisions to go in to infinity, as long as the partition size goes to zero, we know that the limit of such a sequence of Riemann sums exists, and the common limit, independent of how we do this, we're defining to be the definite integral. We've interpreted the definite integral to give us signed area under the curve. And the question we're going to deal with in this video is, does evaluation of the definite integral always require the construction of a sequence of partitions, the evaluation of Riemann sums, and so on? And the answer is decidedly no. So here's an amazing recipe for evaluating the definite integral of a function on the integral from a to b. Step one, find an antiderivative of the integrand function f, that is a function capital F, continuous on the closed interval, for which f prime of x is equal to the integrand function whenever x is in the interior of the interval. That's what we mean when we say we found an antiderivative on the closed interval. In such a situation, then if we evaluate f of b and subtract off f of a, the result we get is amazingly equal to the value of the definite integral on the interval from a to b. This theorem is called the evaluation theorem, or what many people refer to as the fundamental theorem of calculus. So for example, suppose we want the integral of sine on the interval from 0 to pi over 2. So here's a graph of sine, and just for reference, let's calculate a midpoint sum with 10, 10 divisions. It's about 1, a little bit greater than 1. And now let's apply the fundamental theorem of calculus that we just learned. An antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. The derivative of negative cosine is sine. So if we take negative cosine, plug in the endpoints, pi over 2 and 0, and subtract, and carefully evaluate what we get, we should find the value of the definite integral. And this simplifies to 1, and this looks pretty reasonable. It sure looks like we've got the right number here. Let's take a look at the integral of x squared on the interval from a to b. So here's a graph of x squared, and we're looking for this signed area. Antiderivative of x squared is going to be 1 3rd x cubed. And so when we plug in the endpoints b and a into this antiderivative, we get this expression, 1 3rd b cubed minus 1 3rd a cubed. And in previous videos, we've seen that indeed this is what the area is in this case. So once again, we have something that seems to work. So what's the proof? How do we prove the evaluation theorem? The proof is going to be rather elaborate, but it's really worth looking at because it's going to reinforce your understanding of a definite integral as a limit of Riemann sums, but it also sheds light on this amazing connection between integral calculus, the calculus of definite integrals, and differential calculus, the calculus of derivatives. Suppose f is continuous on the closed interval from a to b. Previously, we've learned that if you build a sequence of decorated partitions for the closed interval such that the sequence of partition sizes goes to zero, then you can calculate the associated Riemann sums, and the limit of the sequence of those Riemann sums is guaranteed to exist. We wind up defining the definite integral to equal that limiting value of Riemann sums. Moreover, any other acceptable sequence of partitions leads to the same limiting value. So in this graph, we might build a sequence of decorated partitions and plot the associated sequence of Riemann sums. If the sequence of decorated partitions is acceptable in the sense that its corresponding sequence of partition sizes goes to zero, then the limiting value of the Riemann sums is guaranteed to exist. But if we created a different sequence of partitions whose partition size went to zero, then 
we should be able to evaluate the limiting value of those Riemann sums and we better get the same number. And this will work no matter what acceptable sequence of partitions we build for the subinterval. The common limiting value is what we define to be the definite integral of f on the interval from a to b. So now it's on to the proof of the evaluation theorem. Here's the outline for what we're going to do. First, we'll assume, of course, that we've found an antiderivative function, capital F, whose derivative is the integrand function. Then, we're going to use the mean value theorem to construct an acceptable sequence of partitions whose Riemann sums are all equal to the same value, namely, the value of the antiderivative at one end subtracted from the antiderivative evaluated at the other. Then we're going to invoke the existence theorem for definite integrals to conclude that what this must mean is that the definite integral is actually equal to that same value. Let n be an arbitrary natural number. We'll build a decorated partition of the closed interval, and we'll use n equals subintervals. Let the common width of the subintervals be called delta x. So of course, delta x is going to be the total width of the interval divided by the number of subdivisions. Now, such a partition we'll call a regular partition because all the subintervals have the same size. Of course, we've seen it's not necessary to do that, but it's very easy to work with such partitions, so that's what we're going to use here. Let's label the endpoints of the subintervals and relabel the very endpoints to be consistent. The size of the partition in this case, since each subinterval has the same width, the size of the partition is simply the width of any one particular subinterval. So in this case, it's b minus a over n. So clearly, when n goes to infinity, the partition size goes to zero. Now let's examine a generic subinterval of our regular partition. Suppose we have in hand a function, capital F, whose derivative is little f, the integrand function. Now let's take a look at the graph of capital F. Please notice this is not the integrand function we're looking at at the moment. Now for kicks, we could calculate the average rate of change of this antiderivative on the interval from xk minus 1 to xk. And here's the calculation. The mean value theorem guarantees the existence of some argument on the inside where the tangent slope, f prime of x sub k star, is equal to the average rate of change on the subinterval. This, by the way, is the critical magic moment when differential calculus shows up inside this discussion about integral calculus. Now, since the derivative of capital F is little f, we can replace this expression with f of xk star. The difference between successive endpoints is, of course, what we've called the common width. So here's a way we can rewrite the previous equation. And now we can multiply through both sides by delta x to get this equation. If we rearrange the equation, we can see that the difference in the values of the antiderivative at the endpoints is equal to the value of the integrand function at xk star times the common width delta x. This turns out to be absolutely critical for what follows. We're going to apply this principle on each subinterval to choose an xk star in each subinterval for which the antiderivative evaluated at the endpoints and subtracted is equal to f of xk star times delta x. Now you'll notice, having chosen all these xk stars, we now have a decorated partition. We have a bunch of subintervals. We have a bunch of arguments in each subinterval where we're going to sample the function f. And so we can create the Riemann sum. What does that Riemann sum look like? It looks exactly like this. We're going to apply this critical relationship between the antiderivative and the integrand function on each of these subintervals. Each of the summands inside the top equation can be rewritten in terms of the difference of antiderivatives. Now, if we look at this massive sum, we'll notice a lot of cancellation. 
It's hard to see what the cancellation will look on the inside, but in the end, you realize there are only two terms that are going to survive. F evaluated at xn and F evaluated at x0. And we're going to subtract those values. But of course, those were the endpoints of the original interval, which we can rewrite as f of b minus f of a. So where are we? For each natural number n, the mean value theorem helps us build a decorated partition, pn, for which the Riemann sum for that partition is equal to the antiderivative of f evaluated at b minus the antiderivative of f evaluated at a. By applying this trick over and over again for each natural number, 1, 2, 3, and so on, we can obtain a sequence of decorated partitions, p1, p2, p3, etc. Now when we construct this sequence, the sequence has the following properties. The partition size is just b minus a over n, and therefore, as n goes to infinity, the partition size goes to zero. In other words, we've built an acceptable sequence of partitions. The Riemann sum always gives us the same value for each n, so it's a constant sequence. This is the big consequence of applying the mean value theorem to find just the right decoration so that the Riemann sum comes out to be the same over and over again. So we could plot our sequence of Riemann sums, and we get this constant sequence. But we know that the definite integral is the common limiting value of all sequences of Riemann sums for which the partition size goes to zero. So what's going on? These two limiting values have to be the same. After all, we just constructed an acceptable sequence of partitions. The Riemann sum values happen to stay the same all the time. It was f of b minus f of a. But we know that any particular sequence of Riemann sums that's acceptable is going to give us in the limiting value, the value of the definite integral. So the conclusion is that the integral of our function from a to b is actually equal to the antiderivative of f evaluated at b minus the antiderivative of f evaluated at a. Now here's some helpful notation. This symbol can be thought of as sort of a spring-loaded version of f of b minus f of a. You might see this as a variation. But what it means is that you take f of b and f of a and subtract. It's very helpful when you're concentrating on finding an antiderivative sometime to hold off the actual input of the endpoints for a moment and you just use this notation to say, okay, I've got this antiderivative and the next step's gonna be to evaluate and take the difference, but let's not do that at the moment. I'm just gonna put this little bracket with an a and b and then we'll move on from there. So let's test drive the theorem and the notation. What is the definite integral of x cubed from 0 to 1? Well, let's find an antiderivative. How about 1 quarter x to the fourth? That's a function whose derivative is x cubed. We'll plug in 1 and 0 and subtract, and that will be the value of our definite integral. How about the integral of sine from 0 to pi? Let's find an antiderivative, negative cosine x. We'll plug in pi and 0 and subtract, and that gives us 2. How about the integral of 1 over x on the interval from 1 to 2? So an antiderivative of 1 over x on the interval from 1 to 2 is ln of x, and we'll plug in ln of 2, ln of 1. ln of 1 being 0 means that our definite integral winds up equaling ln of 2. Now here are a few observations about the consistency with interval laws. What does the fundamental theorem say, the evaluation theorem say, about the integral from a to a? Well, if we just apply the evaluation theorem, we would get f of a minus f of a, which of course is zero. And so our new rule, in other words, the evaluation theorem, is consistent with what we've called null integration previously. How about the integral going in the wrong direction? so to speak. Well, take an integral from b to a. Fundamental theorem would say, naively, f of a minus f of b. And it really doesn't matter if you're going in, quote, the wrong direction, because we know that that's the opposite of f of b minus f of a, which the fundamental theorem of 
calculus would tell you is the integral of f on the interval from a to b. So the integral from b to a is the opposite of the integral from a to b. In other words, the fundamental theorem, the evaluation theorem, is also consistent with what we've called the limit swap law. So the lesson here is you can use the evaluation theorem fearlessly whether or not your limits of integration go the wrong way, the right way, whether they're equal to each other. In all these cases, the evaluation theorem is consistent with the interval laws we already have looked at.